Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. I did bring a couple of things with me, and I just want to share a little bit about what we have on the table so that you're aware of it. Uh, one of the things that I brought is a book called Redeemed and Righteous by Nature. It has a study guide with it as well that has questions and all of the uh, areas for you to have notes. But, you know, the Lord began to deal with me about our being in Christ and that when we become new creatures in Christ, we are so new that we don't have the ability to understand all that we can do without the book. We've got to go back to the manual of the creator, forgive me, we've got to go back to the, the handbook of the creator to be able to identify what we're capable of. You know, I know some people who own the top of the line smartphones. They've paid top dollar for a smartphone that the only thing they know how to do is take a picture and make a phone call. <laughs> And, and, you know, there's a lot of Christians who are walking around in their top of the line being in Christ. And the only thing that they know how to do is to be able just to make it day by day and maybe rec receive a little blessing here and there. But we're built with the fullness of Christ. We're built with the plan and the purpose of God in mind. We're built to do great things in his name. And so when we begin to identify who we are in Christ, then we'll be able to see what we can do. And one of the things that we've got to go to the word to identify is our righteousness. Because you can't find righteousness by checking your emotions. You can't identify the righteousness you are in Christ by just checking to to see your natural tendencies or your personality. You've got to let the Word of God identify you in the righteousness you have been made in Christ Jesus because righteousness isn't something you have. It's something you are. You are made the righteousness of God. You are righteous by nature. It's not something you have in your pocket and you can lose by degree. No, righteousness is what you are when you are recreated in Christ Jesus. So to operate in that righteousness, you've got to have the revelation of the word so that the word of God can give you the ability to see into the reality of who you are in Christ. You know, whenever I go to a town that maybe I, I come to town and I got to have some shoes and I say, let me go to the mall. And I go to the mall and I'm not the kind of person that likes to wander the mall. When I go to the mall, I'm going on a, a mission. I'm a woman on a mission. I go into that mall and I, I look for the map. I want to find the map because I want to find where I am, first of all, and then I want to find where I want to be. I look for the shoe store and then I look for that little arrow that says, you are here. And then I map my distance in between. And we've got to have the coordinates of the Word of God to identify where we are. Because you're not in the circumstance. You're not under the circumstance. You're not in the problem. You are in Christ. If any man be in Christ... And so when you find out where you are, you've got your GPS coordinates of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, behold, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are created new. You put those GPS coordinates into your map, and then you tell it where you want to go, and you be your, you, then you have the plan. Then you have the directions of how to get there accurately. So you're not wandering through life trying to achieve what is only achieved by putting in your place in Christ. If it, I found myself praying for my child one day. They were making decisions that were putting them in physical danger. And I was praying for my child, and I was praying from my position as a mama. I was praying with all my mama emotions. I was praying with all my mama my uh, 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 demands on the Lord. Lord, you've got to do something. You've got to save her. This is my child. This is my baby. You know, I'm praying from the position of a mama, and I just see sensed in my spirit, I'm not making very much headway. There's not a lot of progress going on here. 
And so I began to ask the Lord, Lord, where am I missing it? And he said, you're praying from the wrong position. Because if you'll get in your place in Christ, that's where all the equipment is. That's where all the tools are. And so I had to learn how to take my place in Christ and deal with the situation from the place where the authority rests. To deal with the situation from the place where the uh, ability to exercise Jesus' name and apply his blood over that situation. And so the, the answer to a lot of what we are facing is, are we coming at that situation from the place of who we are in Christ? I believe that'll help somebody, redeemed and righteous by nature. And then uh, many of you know my testimony. I've told parts of my testimony here before. I released the original copy of my testimony, Walking in the Graveyard, a number of years ago. But this past October, I celebrated. 30 years walking with Jesus. 30 years free from drugs. 30 years free from a life of crime. For those of you who may not know my testimony, I was born again on August 10th of 1992 after having uh, walked for a number of years. I ran away from home at 15, ended up on the streets of Nashville, Tennessee. I became addicted to cocaine. I became addicted to a drug called Dilaudid, which was similar to what Oxycontin is today. And I was shooting drugs, overdosed a number of times, lost custody of my children, almost went to prison for three counts of attempted armed robbery, and the Lord met me <laughs> and rescued me and saved my life and turned my life around after I had I died of a drug overdose in the back of a bar in East Nashville, in the projects of East Nashville. I overdosed on drugs and I found myself standing in front of a skull. It wasn't a skeleton, it was a skull as tall as, it, it was as tall as I was. And suddenly I realized that hell was real and these hands of darkness began to reach for me and try to pull me in. And in that moment, I began to run and I ran with everything in me and I ran, so I ran back to my body and the person who was doing CPR on my body, suddenly one minute they're trying to get a pull and to get some oxygen into my body. And the next minute, they're fighting this screaming, crazed girl who is kicking and, and screeching. And, and so they let me up, and I was still running. And I ran out of the back of that bar through the projects in East Nashville for about two blocks in the rain with blood dripping down my arm from the overdose, trying to escape what I had seen in that moment. And at that moment I, I decided I don't want to go to hell and I went to a church that night. I died on a Sunday morning in the back of that bar and I went to the church on Sunday night and they weren't quite sure what to do with me. And so they kind of prayed with me, you know, like Lord bless her. But I, I said, I, I died today and I don't want to go to hell. You got to help me. I didn't know about Jesus. I didn't know how to get help from God. And they, the person who had prayed with my late husband who had died of a drug overdose the day before we went to court. It's a long story. Y'all got to get the book. I can't tell it all today. But, but the person, the people who had prayed with them came and found me and took me to a revival. And I, in, the, in that time, I, between the time that I had overdosed, I went to get on a program to try to help me get free from the addiction to the Dilaudid. And so I was on a methadone program and I totaled two cars in the matter of just weeks because I would pass out asleep at the wheel. And so they took me to church and I'm on that methadone and I slept through the first night. They tried to pray with me afterwards and they said I cussed the pastor's wife out really good in the choir room. She's my mother-in-law today so evidently she didn't hold it against me. <laughs> But they took me back the next night after they had, they had put me on their couch and prayed over me all night long and took me back to church. And, and when I was sitting there in the pew asleep again, the pastor of the preacher came and he woke me up and he said, girl, do you want help? And I stood up and I said, in, in that moment, I just had a moment of clarity and I said, I do, please help me. And when the anointing of God hit me, I went to the ground and I knew nothing about falling out in the spirit. 
I, at first, when I came to myself, I was angry because I thought the preacher knocked me down. And I, I was wanting to get some help. I'm like, did y'all see him knock me down? I, I'm up trying to get myself up off the floor. But before I could be angry at the preacher... I realized I was sober for the first time in eight years. I was in my right mind, and they led me to the Lord. That was August 10th of 1992, and I've been serving the Lord and walking with Him and experiencing His restoration in my life since that day. And so that testimony, the full details of all of the, the uh, ins and outs, I gave you a very cliff note version just now, but the full details here in this book, but when I prepared this book for the, the um, uh, expansion, because we expanded the book, it's double the size. This one is now called Escaping Hell, a true story, how God's miraculous power to restore life bent on destruction. And I, I took the five fundamental things that God has taught me over the years that have helped me stay with him and stay in victory and stay clean and stay saved. And I took those five fundamental things and because I've taught them over the last 30 years and I've studied on them, not just for me to learn them myself, but for me to be able to teach the other people. We've been pastoring 25 years now in our Kansas location and eight years this year in our Little, Little Rock location. I've had the opportunity to teach on these and help other people apply them to their lives. And one of the, for instance, we've got knowing who you are in Christ, which we just talked about, your position in Christ. That's number one. You've got to have your identity. Uh, we, I also talk about something else that I want to um, go a little bit deeper in today, and that's learning how to apply the blood of Jesus correctly. Learning how to apply the blood correctly, because I have to tell y'all, the first time that the preacher started talking about blood in church, I was a little bit indignant. I thought, really? This is disgusting. Why are we talking about blood in church? Why are we talking about, I had no clue about the, the redemption at that point. I was a new believer, a new Christian, and I just thought it was a little bit much to talk about the sacrifice of animals. I thought that was a little bit out there. I thought it was out there to talk about Abraham offering his son Isaac. I, I thought, what? This is a little bit far out. But as I began to understand, I'm so glad I didn't leave that service. I'm so glad I stayed to understand the blood because the more I understood the blood, the greater I knew how to apply it. And when I look at the blood, and so many of you, you already have a good solid foundation. I know the, the people you've been learning from. You have a good solid foundation, but you know, faith comes by hearing. And so we can always hear more to strengthen our faith. And so when let's, let's get into a little under uh, a little in-depth understanding here of why the blood is important to us. Because in my life, there was a shift when I learned how to apply the blood correctly. And we'll get into that as we move forward. I want to begin in Hebrews chapter 9. And so just put on your seatbelt and track with me, okay? We're just going just, just gonna to follow the path that the Holy Spirit has for us because we need to see that the blood of Jesus, the blood throughout history, God designed the blood to provide an approach to him. The blood, because of Adam's transgression, when sin entered the earth, God provided the blood. And so here in Hebrews, we see a, a reference to the Old Testament tabernacle. And then we see later in this chapter a recognition that there is a New Testament tabernacle, a new covenant tabernacle that is not made with hands, but it is resident in heaven, and there is an application of the blood there. Hebrews 9, 1, then truly, verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. And then he begins to describe the sanctuary. 
Now we know when the people who brought their sacrifices came, they brought their sacrifices and handed those sacrifices over to the Levitical priests who were working on the brazen altar. And they, they took it, and that's as far as the worshipers went. The worshipers didn't have access to go any further in to the, the holy place or the most holy place. They had that limited access. They brought their blood sacrifices and they could see that blood shed for them on the brazen altar. It was a very large altar, probably as big as this stage area and round and they, I'm talking about the first one in the wilderness, right? And they had this, this large altar and they would bring their sacrifices and those priests would shed the blood of those animals and it gathered in the bottom of this basin and they, that blood all mingled together and became one and they carried that blood in to worship God in the holy place by sprinkling it on the different elements that we read about here. It says there was a candlestick. It says there was a table, the table called showbread, or it's also referred to as the bread of the face, the bread of his presence. And so these different instruments that were in the holy place were sprinkled with the blood. And then beyond the holy place was what we refer to as the Holy of Holies. And it says that there was the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, verse 4. That's where they took the blood, it says here in verse 5, over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. But when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, only the high priest, once every year, and notice this phrase, not without blood. Not without blood. When he went in, he went in through the means of, or with the vehicle of, or through the... the um, application of the blood. He did not enter without the blood because the blood had been established by God as a legal approach to him. So back up and think about it because when Adam and Eve sinned, before they sinned, they had unlimited access to God. They had the ability to be in God's presence and under the thoughts of God. They could talk to God and walk with God and fellowship with God because that's God's desire for us. That's what he wants. He wants to know you and he wants you to know him. He doesn't want there to be any hindrance. He doesn't want there to be any separation. He wants there to be a close, intimate conversation and relationship with his people. But then when sin entered into Adam and entered into to Eve through their transgression, there was a separation caused by that sin, and God became outside of their, their relationship. He was no longer to able to have that communion and that fellowship with them, and they are reacting in a way they'd never reacted before. They're hiding from the presence of God. They're experiencing shame that they had never known before, and that shame caused them to run from the only one who really had the ability to help them. They were hiding from their help because shame told them you can't let him see you this way they're hiding from God and God comes walking and calling for them and immediately they began to make the excuses and you know it's this woman you gave me and and she says it's the serpent and and God begins to explain what's going to happen because of their decision it wasn't God hammering uh, uh, out a a you did that whack I'm going to whack you for that this is what you get. You're going to have to have to work in the dirt and, and toil. And no, God's explaining his a loving heavenly father. And he's saying, because of what you've done, because of this decision that you made to violate my instruction, and you, I told you not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but because you have, let me tell you what's going to happen. Yep. 
But I'm not leaving you. I'm not abandoning you. Even though you're in this situation, I'm going to cover you. And I'm going to bring a help to you. I'm going to have to walk this help out legally because I'm a just God. And I can't just come in here and say, look what the devil did. Let me just zap him and start all over. No, because I'm legal and because I'm just, I have to bring a legal redemption into the earth. I have to bring him in legally through the the womb of a woman because for him to be a kinsman redeemer, for him to have, for him to redeem you, he He's got to have blood, and the only way for him to have blood is for him to become human, but he can't have blood that's connected to Adam's blood because then it would be sinful blood. So I've got to get him into the womb of a woman without the help of a man, and that's why if you have a version of the Bible that doesn't, that doesn't accentuate that there is a virgin birth, you might need to get to set that one up on the counter for a time and make sure you're focused on the fact that Jesus Jesus was born of a virgin. He was born of a virgin because our redemption and our faith in the blood is hinged upon the fact that his blood was different than any other blood available on the planet. That his blood did not have any connection to anybody uh, uh, related to Adam. But Jesus' blood was was the DNA of God. Jesus' blood was supernatural because Jesus is the Word who was made flesh and dwelt among us. That Jesus' blood is free of all sin. There is no sin in His blood, and that's why it qualifies to pay for our sin. When God helped Adam and Eve we see the first mention or reference to shed blood in the garden because for him to cover them with animal skins, there was an animal, an innocent animal, who gave its life and its blood was shed so that those skins could cover Adam and Eve. So the covering of the blood began from the onset of sin so that God could have interaction with his people. Now, we know that God spoke to Cain because we have a record of his conversation with Cain. Cain murdered his brother Abel over a blood sacrifice or over the way God received Abel's blood sacrifice and over the way that God didn't receive his. He brought a sacrifice and it was out of the cursed ground. It was out of his own effort. It was not a a blood sacrifice. And God spoke to him. Do we know God spoke to Cain and said, if you do not well, shall you not be accepted? In other words, don't give up. Just do the right thing and I'll accept you too. If you would would do the right. So did he know the right thing? Here's God talking to him. Did he know the right thing? You know, Hebrews 11.4 says that Abel, he sacrificed by faith. By faith, Abel sacrificed a more acceptable offering, a more excellent offering. How does faith come? By hearing. So he heard an instruction God gave an instruction, and so by faith, Abel brought what God said to bring. By faith, Abel brought what God said to bring. Why? Because you can't cover, uh, Cain couldn't cover his sin with his sacrifice of vegetables. He couldn't cover his sin with that. There wasn't an accurate uh, uh, um, exchange rate for what was in that bag of vegetables or that basket of vegetables to cover his sin. The exchange rate was the innocent blood. And so when Abel, by faith, by following a word of God, brought to God the acceptable sacrifice, he brought him a blood sacrifice and God accepted that sacrifice and the relationship would be able to continue. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Why? Because God never wanted to abandon us. Even though Adam had walked away from God, God didn't walk away from Adam. He had a way for him to maintain a relationship. It wasn't as intimate. It wasn't as close-knit. Why? Because that sin separation caused a, a, an area that, that hindered that intimacy. I look at it this way. You know, I've done a lot of prison ministry over the last 30 years. Anybody ever it, it, maybe done prison ministry or you've visited someone in prison or maybe you've seen a, a documentary about how, how families go to visit their prison, their, their family members in prison? Well, when you do, you're set in a supervised area, depending on, on whether it's medium or maximum, what kind of visit you can have. Sometimes you have a visit with plastic in between you with, a, with a, a screen dividing you and you have to talk through a telephone to the person and they have to come over and pick up the telephone. You, there's no, no ability to touch them or hug them. Sometimes you get to go into a visitation room uh, that has all kinds of other people in it and you get to sit and have a visit with them. But it's not the same as, as sitting down and your lazy boy with a, a glass of tea chatting with your son or daughter. It's not the same. And so here's God who's got prison visits with his kids. Here's God, the, our loving heavenly father who created us in his image and in his likeness, having to come visit from a distance, visit with a separation, visit with this limitation. Hallelujah. But he was willing to do what was necessary to provide the full restoration in the relationship. So here we see that from the beginning, God was teaching people how to approach him through the shed blood. He taught Abel how to approach him because Abel had faith to act on. He dealt with Cain how to approach him verbally communicating with him, if you would do the right thing, you would be accepted too. When Noah came, you know, how many, what did Noah take on the ark with him? What did Noah take on the ark with him? He took animals on the ark, right? And, and you'll see two by two, he took two of everything. He took more of some things. Right. He didn't, there were some animals he specifically took for the purpose of having an offering when he got off the ark. He carried, he prepared. Why? Because God had dealt with him and told him exactly what to put on the ark. And God told him, when you come off the ark, you're going to need to have a blood sacrifice to cleanse the earth. So bring on the ark with you animals specifically for the purpose of approaching me with blood. And so when he came off, the very first thing Noah did, the first thing he did was offer Offerings of blood, sacrifices yeah. to yeah. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we see God establishing covenant with Abraham, we see a lesson taught with the ram in the thicket. Abraham brought his obedience. God asked him for his son, and Abraham went as he went in his heart all of the way so that the Bible tells us he came to the place in his faith that he knew if God has to raise him from the dead. He, in his heart, had already received him raised from the dead. I'm going to offer my son just like God told me to offer my son. And I'm determined that God will raise him up because he said, through Isaac shall my seed be. And I've been looking at the stars and I've been telling, so shall my seed be through Isaac. So shall my seed be. So Isaac has to live. I'm going to offer him, but Isaac has to live. And because Abraham offered his son, God had legal access to offer his for us. Amen. But we see a lesson that begins in this relationship when the ram was caught in the thicket, that ram became a substitute. And God began teaching that lesson of substitution throughout so that the people of God began to practice looking at the substitute who is taking my place. 
We see it there with the ram in the thicket. We see it when God brings the children of Israel out of Egypt and he says, I want every man to take a lamb for his family. Every man provide a lamb for the family and take that lamb, shed the blood of that lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, put it on the lintels and the, the, front, the, the top and the sides of the doorpost. And when I see the blood, when I see the blood, so there was something that the blood was able to mark that became visible in the eyes of God, that God was able to look at the life that was represented by the blood, that the innocence that was represented by the blood, and God was to recognize these are protected, these are kept, no weapon formed against them shall be able to prosper, no evil shall befall them, no plague shall come near their dwelling. Why? Because the blood is speaking. Did the blood of, of Abel speak from the ground? The blood of Abel spoke from the ground, didn't it? God said, I can hear the blood speaking from the ground. But the Bible says that the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel spoke. Our blood is speaking too. The blood of our master, the blood of our savior, the blood of our redeemer is saying mercy, compassion, righteous. Hallelujah. Abel's blood cried out vengeance, but Jesus' blood cries out for mercy, forgiveness. Hallelujah. When they took the blood and placed the blood over their homes, there was supernatural protection, supernatural keeping power because God said, when I see the blood, I believe God still wants to see the blood today. I believe God wants to look at your children and see you've been applying blood to them. Grown children too, you've been applying some blood to them, right? He wants to be able to look and see that there's blood coverings, that there are blood applications in his people. Amen. He said, when I see the blood, he's looking for the blood. Hallelujah. We see that they came out of Egypt and 50 days later, Israel reached Sinai, but the covenant had to be established. And in Exodus chapter 24, let's look at verse eight. God has Moses to speak and to declare some things over the people. I'm actually going to begin in 20, 20, let's see, I said 25, 8. Let's go back to chapter 24 and look at verse 6. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. Now think about this. This is the closest application of the blood that has been experienced. <laughs> they have gone from the blood on the altar to the blood on the people. He, they, he sprinkles the blood on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you concerning all of these words. And in chapter 25, verse 8, God asks for a more intimate relationship. God says, let them make me a sanctuary. Let them make me a sanctuary. Why? Because now that the blood has been sprinkled, the closer the application of the blood, the more intimate the relationship can be. He says, now that the blood has been established as a covenant sprinkled on the people, I want to be closer to you. Make me a sanctuary. I want to dwell with you. I don't want to be a far away God. I want to be right there in your presence with you. I want to be the one who leads you. I want to be the one who comforts you. I want to be the the one who strengthens you. I want to be the one who is your all in all. Amen. Hallelujah. And how does that happen? The approach is through the blood. The approach is through the blood. Hallelujah. So the blood contact became closer and God desired more intimate relationship with his people. Yes, Hallelujah. When God established what we were earlier describing 
the tabernacle in the wilderness, God gave Moses the diagram and the pattern of the, the outer courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy place. And the blood is the central focus of how it all was established. It was the blood from the moment that they sacrificed on the brazen altar, and then the blood went through each of the parts to make the way from the gate to the presence of God. The way was established by the blood. And so that, we see, became a pattern for 1,500 years. Are you tracking with me? We're, we're, we're moving. I know we're moving quick through this, but we're going somewhere, right? So, so 1,500 years, they practiced the lesson of substitution. They practiced bringing a substitute and watching that innocent substitute die in their place to cover their sin. And they, they, became, they became aware every time because it wasn't, Generally, it wasn't a lamb that they had no contact with. It was a lamb they had raised. And if you've ever seen lambs, they are so sweet and so loving and so tender. And so, I mean, they are just easy to get attached to because they're so cute. These families are watching a lamb that has been raised from birth in their, their farm, on their ranch, in their household. And now they're having to take this lamb who has such a special place in the children's hearts, who is so, so sweet. They're taking this lamb who's never hurt a fly and never hurt anybody. But now we're taking this innocent lamb and I'm going to watch its blood pour out so that my relationship with God can be covered for a year. They practiced knowing the lesson of substitution. So can you imagine? Can you imagine the shock when John the Baptist steps up and says something that totally took them out of their way of thinking? And he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world away what takes away sin no 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 we know lambs who cover sin we're 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 skilled we're proficient in that now lambs cover sin you telling me there's a lamb that can take away sin behold the lamb of god you remember every man every father prepare a lamb for the house the fathers prepared his lamb and john saw him walking down the riverside and said this is the lamb that the heavenly father has provided for his house and this lamb is going to do what no other lamb has been able to do. This lamb is going to do something with our sin that there has no lamb been able to accomplish before this day. He's going to take it away. Take away, take away sin, take away sin. What? The lamb of God who taketh away. He had to have an anointing just to declare it. It was so far-fetched from their minds. The anointing and the office of, of him to proclaim the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And the devil couldn't figure it out. The devil couldn't figure it out. The devil thought, we got to kill him. and We got to kill him. Yeah, go right ahead. We got to kill him. We'll get his own people to turn on him. And the high priest offered up the lamb. And the Bible says if the enemy had known, he would never have crucified the Lord of glory. He didn't understand how there was righteous, innocent blood in the Lamb of God. He didn't understand how Jesus legally got into a man's body. He wasn't pretending to be a man. He became a man. He set aside his omnipotence. He set aside his omnipresence. He set aside his omniscience. And he came in the form and the fashion of a man. He came as a man born of a woman, born of a woman 
of a virgin. He was legally man and legally God. And the devil would encounter him in the church and say, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of Israel, as if he's putting him on blast, as if he's calling him out. I mean, think about that. He wasn't advertising for God. He was trying to say, you're here illegally. We know who you are. You are the Holy One of Israel. And one of them got so, so bold, so audacious that he said, I adjure you by God. A devil said that to Jesus. What were they thinking? They thought Jesus was there illegally. They thought the Holy One was in a human body illegally. And they said, we adjure you by God that you torment us not. Because they did not understand how the Word became flesh. They did not understand that God legally put his word in the womb of a woman and that word became flesh and that word walked among us as a man legally carrying sinless blood. He was tempted in every way without sin. He had to be legally tempted. He had to be, he had to have every temptation brought to him. And he, as a man born of God, resisted every temptation so that you and I, as men and women born of God, can resist every temptation in him, through him, by him. But because he legally overcame temptation, legally walked in this body, and legally came to the place to offer himself on the altar of the cross, Hebrews 13.10 says, we have an altar. And, And the Bible says in the book of Exodus, whatsoever touches the altar shall be made holy. We have an altar. And whatsoever touches the altar shall be made holy. The altar that has been prepared by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We come to that altar and we're made holy. And the devil still doesn't get it. And he still doesn't understand it. But that's okay. We'll just keep taking authority, taking ground, walking out the plan of God, working the word, seeing the victory that is ours in Christ come to pass. Amen? But the approach of the blood... The blood that Jesus shed, the blood that he legally brought to this place, it wasn't just for the cross, it was for the entrance. It, it didn't, he didn't just shed the blood at the cross and leave it there. The blood had to be taken into the Holy of Holies. And that's why when one of the women who came to finish the burial preparations and he says, Mary, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my God and to your God, my father and your father. Why was he ascending? Hallelujah. The, the Bible tells us, let's go back to Hebrews. The Bible tells us that that blood has now been taken into the heavenly version of that tabernacle we were just looking at. Now, in Hebrews 9, when it said that they went in every year, not without blood, verse 8, the next verse says, the Holy Ghost, this signifying, or he was showing that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. That's what they were seeing when the High priest alone entered with blood. The Holy Spirit was teaching a lesson. He was explaining the way into the holiest of all isn't yet open. But chapter 10. And verse 19 says, Having therefore, brethren... Boldness to enter, what? You and I can enter 
into the place that once only the high priest could go? That there's an open door policy where the presence of God is concerned, where the holy of holies is concerned, open door policy for anybody who comes by the blood? Says boldness to enter. Boldness to enter. How do we have boldness to enter? Into the holiest. How do we have boldness to enter? By the blood of Jesus. When I have faith in the blood, the evidence in my life is you'll see me coming to him. If I'm never going into the holy of holies to approach the throne of God's grace, most of the time it's because I I haven't built faith in the blood. It's because a person doesn't know what that blood has done for them, doesn't know that that door is open. And because of that lack of faith in the blood, there's a lack of boldness in the body. Not in this body, but we're talking about those other, we're going to help the other people, right? We're going to, we're, but we're rec- the more I know about the blood, the more boldness, the more courage, the more confidence I'm going to have to come into the throne of God. To come before his presence. Why? Because I'm, I'm blood washed. <laughs> I, I'm not coming in Michelle. I'm coming through the blood. I'm coming washed by that blood. I know what that blood has done for me. I know what that blood has done in me. I know what that blood has changed. So I don't have to come to God always seeing my failures because I've washed those failures with the blood. I don't have to come to God carrying the shame and the degradation of my past because that's not who I am. I've washed in the blood. And that's where I came to with my understanding about how to apply the blood correctly. Because I got born again on August 10th of 1992. And I believed that Jesus Christ died on the cross and the blood that he shed on the cross paid for my sins. I believed that. I understood that the blood was a payment. You know, I had a person that um, I had known in my life before Christ who received a pardon from the governor of the state of Tennessee. He was 100% guilty of the crime he had committed. But because he had finished his sentence, because he had been uh, walking as an upright citizen and not breaking any laws, he was able to go to the governor and ask for a pardon so that what he had, le- he had seriously done It was expunged off of his record. You could go look at his record. It's no longer on his record. That's how I understood what the blood of Jesus did for me on the cross. I did those things I was guilty of. I committed the crimes that that were on my record. I did every one of them. I I didn't deserve forgiveness, but because Jesus shed his blood to pay for my sin debt, all of those debts have been expunged and they're no longer on my record. God has no record of my sin because of the blood. I believed that. And I began walking with the Lord and I was serving God and my husband who I, who I am married to today, God brought him into my life. He is a man who loves me like Christ loves the church. He is a man of God with a call of God on his life. We began, we, we were married. We, we got custody of my children back. I actually had custody of my children back when we were married, when we got married. And, and so we're beginning to uh, walk out the plan and the purpose that God has for my life and for his life. And we're seeing the, the goodness of God and we find out we're expecting a baby. I was so excited because, you know, with, the, with my previous pregnancies, I was in, involved in prostitution. I was, yeah, just, just it's the blood, y'all. I was involved in, in crime and in all kinds of just 
chaos. It was just a mess of a life. And I didn't in, in have anything that I looked back at those pregnancies and was able to enjoy about bringing my children into the world. And so here I am with a man who loves me with a, a good godly life. And I'm excited about bringing a baby into this marriage. And, and I began to show evidence that I'm losing the child. And my husband, being a man of faith, he said, we're going we're gonna to believe God. I'm going to lay my hands on you and we're going to believe God. God's going to keep that baby in your womb. You're going to bring that baby to full term. He's saying all the right things. He's quoting all the right verses. He's standing in faith. He's believing God. But there was something in, that happened in me in that instance that I didn't expect to happen. I, it was like, have you ever seen a spy movie and they brainwash somebody and then they, they go on with their life and then someday they get a phone call and they say a trigger word and they go do whatever they were brainwashed to do. It was like the enemy had this hidden trigger. And when this happened, this shame came up in me. Shame from my past. Shame from the, the things I had done before Christ. Shame for the way I'd lived my life. And that shame stood against my righteousness. Here I need to have the righteousness, which is a faith. I need my faith to work. I need to believe God. But this shame is hindering me. And it's telling me, this shame begins to tell me, this is happening because of, of the abortion you had before you got saved. This is happening because you never, you weren't raising your kids. This happened because of that life you were living before. And it, all of this shame just began to tell me why God was doing this to me, why this was happening to me, that I was reaping what I had sowed in my past. I thought, why? Well, I thought I was redeemed from all that. But that shame convinced me to lay down my breastplate of righteousness. And I walked away from that situation in defeat and we lost that child. It was about a year or so later that I began to do a study on the blood of Jesus. And as I was studying about the blood, the Lord showed me where the enemy had, what the enemy had done to get defeat over onto me. He said, Hebrews 9, 14. Can you go there with me? We'll begin in 13, Hebrews 9, 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself Without spot to God, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your con I needed that. When I came through that study of the blood to that scripture, the Lord highlighted it. And he said, that's where you were missing it. You had applied the blood to the guilt, but you had never applied the blood to the shame. You knew you were free of the guilt but you thought it was okay for the shame to have operation in your life. You thought it was just natural for that shame to crop up and to speak to you that way because you really did those things and the shame of it was still attached to the failures and the sins from your past. And you never resisted the shame. And it was the shame and the condemnation that convinced me to set aside. Righteousness would have worked yep. if I wouldn't have set it down. Yeah. That's good. My right standing with God would have been enough for me to receive his help. But I laid it aside. He didn't fail me. I laid aside the help that was there through a lack of knowledge. And I allowed shame to convince me of something that wasn't even true. And with that teaching, with that understanding, with that revelation that the blood of Jesus, how much more shall the blood purge your conscience? I realized I've only interacted with the blood once in my life. Now for those of y'all who have been raised in a good church that taught you about the blood, 
you should thank God because I was not raised in church. All I knew was that one interaction. I had not talked about the blood, prayed about the blood, read about the blood until I started doing this study about the blood. The only thing I knew about the blood was that it freed me from the sin debt that I owed. I was thankful for it, but I hadn't interacted with the blood anymore. I hadn't applied it. I hadn't pulled it into my prayer life. I hadn't been speaking about the blood or, or speaking the blood over anything in my life until I saw that. I'm supposed to be applying the blood to my conscience. It was revelation to me. I was supposed to be taking the blood and whenever shame tries to come on me, I'm supposed to take the blood against that shame because I'm redeemed from shame just like I'm redeemed from guilt. And if you look and see the definition, guilt is something you've done. You can be found guilty. It's a state or a condition that a person is in because of an action they've done. And that guilt was dealt with by the blood of the cross, but shame is that feeling in the consciousness, that feeling that was a result of the things that I've done. I had applied the blood to the guilt, but I hadn't applied the blood to the shame. And if we don't, righteousness becomes hindered. If we don't deal with the shame, there are some things in your life that the blood is the only tool that works. Glory to God. There are, I'm going to say it again. Think about it. There are some things in your Christian life that only the blood, the blood is the only tool. It's the tool we're supposed to pull out of the toolbox and put to work on that situation. Hallelujah. I didn't even know I was supposed to touch the blood or think about the blood or anything. But we're supposed to be interacting with the blood consistently, building our faith in the blood consistently, strengthening our understanding of how that blood, the, you know, the blood is at work in your body right now. You don't even have to think about it, but the blood in your body is carrying things throughout your body to help your life. And the blood of Jesus needs to have its operation in the body. The blood to cleanse us from that shame. Yes, Hallelujah. How much more shall the blood of Christ purge? The word purge, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to pray. The word purge means not just to clean something up, but it means clean to the sanctification. It's a, a word that was used to say that how they prepared as priests to approach God. The blood of Jesus cleanses you so completely that you are set apart Amen. And, and qualified or able to approach God. The blood purges with such a cleansing that it, in the cleansing is a qualifying. In the cleansing is a, a preparation for the presence. In the cleansing of the blood, there's a preparation for the presence of God. And the evidence that we have faith is found in how we approach. The more we see ourselves coming to God with courage, with confidence, I'm entering your presence. You know why? You're coming with a smile instead of talking about all of your failures, talking about all of the, the things you've done that, that fell below the mark. We're not even bringing those up when we've been focused on the blood, when we've been fellowshipping with the blood, when we've been washing in the blood. We're coming instead with a smile and we're saying, Father, I'm so excited to talk to you today. I'm so excited about what you're doing in my life today. Father, I'm so excited about how you have prepared paths for me and you have made, made preparations for me. Father, you're coming with that same excitement that God desires. He's so excited to talk to you. He's so excited to share with you the things he's been, that he has prearranged and made ready for you to live. 
He doesn't want to have to spend the first 20 minutes of your conversation listening to how you fell short of the mark. He'd much rather you just go ahead and purge your conscience of all that and come to him and say, Father, I love you. You are amazing. And the blood of your son has washed me and I come in the presence today with a confidence. That's the evidence we have faith in what the blood's done for us. It's, it's in the approach. The boldness to enter. The boldness to enter. And I challenge you, spend some time in these scriptures about the blood. Spend some time praising God for the blood. Spend some time applying the blood. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.